Welcome back to another Clifton Cameras video. We're here at the wonderful Cannock Ponds in the Forest of Dean and we're here with our very own Martin Drew who's going to be giving us an introduction to binoculars, spotting scopes and digiscoping. Martin, now I have to confess I know very little about binoculars or any of this sort of thing so I often get quite confused with the numbers when I'm looking at these things what do they mean where do I start I mean okay it can seem a little bit bewildering with it with the numbers at, at first when you're not familiar with them right not that difficult really with binoculars a binocular will be described by two numbers and you'll see the same the same combinations of numbers coming up time and time again. So for example, common ones would be 8 by 42, 10 by 25, 12 by 50, etc. etc. Okay. The first number just refers to magnification. So if it's an 8 by 25, that that magnifies eight times. If it's a 10 by 50, that magnifies 10 times. Right. Uh, 7 by 42 magnifies seven times. Okay. So basically, it puts you seven times, eight times, 10 times closer to what you're looking at. So with a 10 times, if something's 100 meters away, it right. be as if it's 10 meters away. Right, I see. It really is that simple. So first number, magnification. So the second number? Second number is Di the diameter of the objective lenses. Now the objectives are the so, ones furthest away from your face. That's right. it, objectives. Yep. On a binocular, that second number will be the diameter of each of those in millimeters. So this is a little eight by twenty-five. So each of these objectives is twenty-five millimeters across. Right. You've got, uh, I believe, an eight by forty-two there. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Each objective forty-two millimeters across. You can see it's a bigger binocular straight yeah. away. Twenty-five yeah, yeah. against forty-two. I see. And I have a 10 by 30, so I've got 10 times magnification, and each of these is 30 millimetres across. Right, okay, okay, I see. So what that actually means in terms of use is, very, very simple terms, the bigger that objective area, the more light gathering, theoretically, that you'll get with the binocular. Okay? Right, I see. Bigger surface area to actually draw in the light. Okay, so um, am I right in thinking then that bigger is better? Not necessarily, no. There's right. a few things to think about here. One factor is handshake. Now, all of us have handshake to mm -hmm. a greater or lesser extent. Yep. And that handshake will actually be magnified by the binocular. I see. So the higher the magnification, the more that the, the handshake will be magnified as well. For most of us, 10 times is pretty much the highest magnification that we can use comfortably for extended periods. Um, without handshake detracting from the image right because it's no good having top quality optical glass having the best sharpest image if, if you then get shape coming in and taking away from the you know detracting from the image taking away from the sharpness of what you're seeing gotcha so for general all-round use I wouldn't really recommend going any higher than 10 times right eight times ten times but by far the most you know the most usable magnifications I would say right something else to think about comes down to where you're going to be using the binocular and yeah, that, that's quite important for example we're in the forest of Dean here yep if I am birding I do most of my birding in the forest of Dean so I'm in an environment like we see here I'm in woodland yeah uh, I use an eight times binocular what I'm looking at generally in this environment isn't particularly far away I'm okay. not looking over huge open spaces so for me that eight times gives me enough magnification and it also gives me a really nice field of view as well because with the same equivalent binoculars within a range sure. as your magnification increases your field of view will narrow down as well if you think about you standing close to something yeah. your field of view narrows yeah 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 okay so for me i don't need huge magnification i do like a nice field of view right. so an eight times works really well and for me that was much well for an all-round binocular okay if you live somewhere or are going to use a binocular primarily in a more open environment say for example open moorland or if you live near a, a big estuary right big salt marsh something like that you might find that something like a 10 times gives you a bit of an edge you might find that that extra magnification just works. brings things that yeah brings things that little bit closer that you might, you might yeah, find yeah. that works to your advantage i see if you're going above that sort of magnification 
generally I would struggle to hold anything at 12 times, 15 times, I would struggle to hold that steady for extended periods. Um, those sort of magnifications quite often best used on a tripod if the binocular has been used in a fixed location. I for see. example, if somebody's got a house overlooking the sea or an estuary or something like that, they might have a more powerful binocular because the tripod then is taking away the, the factors of the shake so right. that doesn't come into it quite so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's those are things that, to bear in mind. Also with it with the smaller objective you, you have a smaller binocular so that translates into um, less weight, less weight to carry around as well. Yeah. This is a 10 by 30. Mm -hmm. Now with binoculars I would class anything with an objective of 30 millimeter above is full size, anything below is compact. So this is 30, that's 25. I've got a small full size and I've got a compact binocular. Yeah. What you've got there is a 42, that would be the, a standard full size binocular. Yeah. Now you can see, if you compare these, even against what you've got there, that the smaller objective translates into smaller and generally lighter binocular as well. So more lightweight, more easily to take around with you. Exactly, if you're going to be using for extended periods of time, so I might, certain times of year, I might be out in the field with the binocular around my neck for five, six, seven hours, something yes. like this, weighing less than 500 grams, could be around my neck all day, you barely notice it's there. Yep. If I have an 800, 900 gram binocular, which I did have at one point, right. I would notice it. Because you're feeling that by the end of the day. Definitely, definitely, yeah. because the effects of that weight are cumulative, over a period of time as well. Yep. With your, your compact binoculars, sometimes known as pocket binoculars, which as I said earlier, I would class as anything with an objective of less than 30 millimetres. What these are really, really useful for, um, for example, if, you, if you're travelling or hiking or something like that, you want something small, really lightweight to have in the uh, pockets of a, a hiking trouser or a rucksack. Yep. Really, really ideal. They also work really well, I think, for a backup. So, for example, a small binocular to keep in a glove compartment, for example, when yep. you just happen to be out and about and see something and think, I wish I had a binocular. Really ideal for that. Yep. With the compacts, e even with the better compacts, compared to even a small full-size binocular, you do notice a difference in terms of you know the, the, the width of the image that you're seeing and the brightness of the image that you're seeing as well. Sure. So even a really good compact, say with an objective 25, will struggle a bit to, to compete with a small, good quality, full size, for example, 30 millimeter, 32 millimeter. Yeah. So you, you're moving up a little bit in size and weight, but there is a big jump in performance to my eye. Right. That jump for me is more than the jump between the 30 and the 42 that you've got, for example. Yeah. Once you've got to full size, you know, you've, you've made the, the most significant jump in, in my view. Right, I see. Why then, Martin? So I've got my I've got my binoculars. Why would I now need a spotting scope? In one word, magnification. Right. Increased magnification because your binoculars, depending on which model you go for will typically give you a magnification somewhere between 8 and 10 times, the most commonly used magnifications. Right. A spotting scope will give you much more than that. Magnifications vary. These days, typical magnifications for a spotting scope, you'd have a zoom eyepiece maybe going from 20 times to 60 times. Wow. 25 times to 50 times. Yep. In some cases, even more than that. If I go into the field, uh, watching birds, wildlife, I will carry binoculars and spotting scope. And I tend to think of it as giving me three stages of, of magnification, if you like. First okay. of all, I've got my naked eye, yep. which gives me the least magnification, but wide field of view, so great for picking things up. Yep. I've then got my binocular, which in my case gives me eight times. Right. So again, I can home in on something, and I can be also useful for, for picking things up, because I've still got a reasonably wide field of view. Sure. When I've then found something which looks interesting that I want a better look at, I would then set the scope up, switch to the scope, and with the scope you can just get absolutely stunning views of the wildlife in particular because you get that, that power, right. that magnification that just lets you zoom in really close and get um, incredible detail from what you're viewing. Okay, so now that I've established that I need a spotting scope, what am I looking for? Okay, there's a few things to think about here. One thing um, I would look at initially is the actual size of the scope, which translates pretty much into the, the diameter of the objective lens, the lens at the front of the scope. Okay. Broadly speaking, you can separate scopes into large objective and small objective. What we have here is a little 52 millimeter objective spotting scope, so very much in the, the smaller end of the scopes. 
This one has got an 85 millimeter objective, so that's a big objective. Right. Now, the difference that you'll get with large and small objective in the world is light gathering. The right. surface area of your objective to, to draw the light in is going to be a lot bigger in an 85 than it is in a 52. So is that like the same as having a wider aperture? Effectively, you can think of it like that. It's light gathering effectively. You'll get more light reaching your eye effectively. So if you're using the scope in, in adverse light conditions, say you're using the scope at dawn or dusk, yep. or certainly in, in, in Britain, in the winter, for example, you know, depths of winter, December, January, you know, you could be out on a real, a real dull and lucky day. Yep. It's quite overcast today, even right. though it's in the morning, it's quite ill. That's when this will have the advantage. Right. Your larger objective, more light gathering. And what that does, it can actually allow you to spend longer in the field as the light's going maybe later in the day. Yeah. Okay. Right. So that, that is an advantage you'll get with the larger objective. I see, I see. Only trade off you've got with that, of course, is increased weight. So you'll have a little bit more weight to carry. Having said that though, modern manufacturers now, modern body material scopes have got lighter. Okay. So even some of the larger scopes um, are surprisingly light compared to say what you had 20 years ago, yeah. um, noticeably lighter, even, even with a big scope. So that's one thing I would look at, large scope or small scope. Another thing I would look at is whether you have either straight body or angled body. Okay, and what's the difference? Well, both of these are angled bodies. You can see that the eyepiece, the part that you're looking through, angles up at about 45 degrees from the body. Okay. Angled scopes are by far the most popular option for, for all round general use and general observation. Okay. Um, it, it's a bit easier to actually sort of look down into an angled scope, particularly if the scope's being shared. Right, so you have two people sharing the scope or, or, or more, you can set an angled scope up to accommodate the height of the shortest person and it's really easy for taller people to then bend down and look through the scope. Right, okay. okay? So that tends to be a major advantage of an angled scope. A straight through scope would be like this, exactly what we see here, but your eyepiece would come straight out at the back, it wouldn't, wouldn't be angled up at all. Right. Now with a straight scope, it has to be set specifically to the height of the user. Okay, because you have to have it lined up directly with, with your the height of your eye. Sure. So for yeah. example, if there's more than one person using the scope and they differ in height, it'd have to be adjusted every time. I see. Right. The other thing that you tend to find with that as well is that with the straight scope, because it has to be set higher, you have to extend the centre column of the tripod. That can reduce your stability. If you can get away without extending the centre column on a tripod, all the better. Right. And generally with an angled scope, you don't have to do that. You can see here, I haven't extended the, the centre columns at all. Right. So I'm going for maximum stability because if you're working at high magnifications, yep. it's like using long focal length the camera lens. You want anything you can do to reduce shake. Shake is a, a big advantage. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Where a straight scope can be advantageous, two main areas really. One is in some hides. If you're using the scope from hides a lot, you can actually line it up specifically precisely with the, the height of the, the window that you're looking through. I see. An angle can be a little bit awkward sometimes, you might have to sort of clamber up and peer down into the scope. Right, yep. And the other area where a straight can have an advantage is if you're digiscoping, whereby you're connecting a camera um, or, or smartphone to your, to your scope to, to capture videos or images. It can be a little bit easier just to line the whole thing up. So that's two areas where a straight can have advantages, but for all round viewing, angles are generally by far the most most popular option i see with these scopes i've noticed ed hd what what do these mean what does this okay. mean? okay you'll see terms like that quite a lot on optical equipment scopes and binoculars in fact commonly you'll get ed hd apo hg different manufacturers use different terms yeah they basically mean, mean very similar things the hd high definition HG high grade, right. uh, for example, ED extra low dispersion glass. They're just ways of designating a higher grade of optical glass. So any scope which has that that suffix on there will have a higher grade of glass, which to give you enhanced performance in terms of colour saturation, brightness, sharpness of the image that you see. I see. Yeah. If the scope hasn't got that, it'll have what we what we loosely term standard glass, so it, do, it doesn't have the ED, the HD, etc., etc. So if it doesn't mention anything at all, it's going to be standard. 
Generally yes. yes. Generally right. yes. And what you will find is that with standard glass, you will notice, for example, more colour fringing around the edges of objects, pale objects against a dark background, dark objects against a pale background, less colour saturation, your colours won't be quite as rich. Yep. Um, See, so effectively, you have like a standard level of glass and then you have an enhanced level of glass. There will be a bit of a price premium for that. With a scope, I would say it's worth it because right. you, do, you do reap the benefits of having an enhanced glass. I see. Okay, Martin, so we've had a look at spotting scopes, we've had a look at binoculars, digiscoping, where do we, where do we start? Okay, digiscoping. Digiscoping is something which is becoming increasingly popular these days. Really, digiscoping is effectively just the process whereby you connect an image capture device, whether it be a camera or increasingly these days a smartphone, yep. to an optical device, which in this case is a spotting scope. Yep. to connect together by means of a digiscoping adapter. Right. So in, es in essence, that is what is meant by digiscoping. Okay. When you're, you're trying to photograph wildlife, uh, di digiscoping can offer one main advantage of focal length. Yeah. Long focal length. Right. With some of the scopes which are available now, depending on what scope you're using, what type of camera you're using, you can find yourself working at focal lengths, which in some cases can be over 3,000 millimetres. Wow. So if you compare that even to a big DSR lens, that's which focal length. That's pretty impressive. It is. Generally, you will, you'll get your best quality at lower focal lengths. You know, so quite commonly, you might be shooting at 1,000 millimetre, 1,200 millimetre. Those tend to be more commonly used, okay. um, but obviously you have got the potential there to work to you know, huge focal lengths if you so desire. Uh, so that, in essence, is what is meant by digiscoping. And um, is there any sort of accessories that you can use with these? Or? Okay, well once you've got your image capture device, um, your adapter and your, and your scope, other things I would look at would be anything that helps with your shake. Right, because one of the issues that you have with focal lengths of the sort that I've mentioned is that shake uh, can, can be a problem. Yeah, you, said, you said earlier with the binoculars, when you're zoomed in that much, it magnifies. Effectively, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's the yeah. same thing, it's the same principle. Same yeah, yeah. principle, really long focal length. Uh, so even the process of pressing the shutter button, for example, right. can introduce shake. Yeah. So for me, I think there's two important things to consider to help reduce that. One is always try and use a really good sturdy stable tripod. Yep. Yeah, like, yeah this is a fairly chunky tripod that we've yeah, yeah, got yeah. here. Um, that is important. Something else which is worth considering is using a remote shutter release as well. Right. Just to avoid that process whereby you have to introduce shape the pressing down on the shutter button. I see. Um, these are available for DSLRs, uh, for compact system cameras for one or two compact cameras also for um for phone when I, when I use my phone to digiscope which yep. is something that I like to do I use a little bluetooth remote which you've sure. got here yeah yeah again it just takes that shake out you if you don't have a remote you can help to combat the problem by using the uh, the time shutter release on your camera so typically yep, two sure. seconds or ten seconds yeah yeah for me because we're talking about wildlife the issue there is that 10 seconds or even two seconds can give you this, much. yeah, yeah it can yeah. give your subject ample opportunity to fly off and run yeah. away etc if your subject is static static or if it's a bird preening or roosting for example that's fine but ideally a, 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 a remote a remote of some sort i think just helps to take, capture take that image quickly exactly. off camera so to speak exactly yeah, yeah. you've got it yeah, so, yeah. yeah. excellent so that was a brief introduction to binoculars, scopes and digiscoping. Big thank you to Martin for helping us out with the video. If you'd like to be informed about future Clifton Cameras content, please like and subscribe. Yeah.